energy, passion, and excitement about science. So uh, speaking of Kate, the next session is one that uh, we're all really excited about. Kate Rubens is an extraordinary person. She's an astronaut. She's a molecular biologist. She spent 115 total days in space on the space station returning just a few months ago. In August 2016, she was the first person to sequence DNA in space. I believe she was also the first person to observe beating heart cells in space. And I heard her audible gasp uh, when she saw that. So she's, she's, she conducted two spacewalks, nearly, or nearly 13 hours outside the space station, and she's certainly an advocate of, of space-based research. Uh, joining Kate and moderating the discussion will be Rachel Crane from CNN. Uh, she's CNN's space and science, science correspondent. She develops amazing video content across CNN's many different platforms. In addition to CNN, Rachel also worked uh, for Bloomberg. She has a long history of covering innovation, including interviews with Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, and Charlie Bolden. So please welcome Kate Rubens and Rachel Crane to the stage. I have no hand to shake. <laughs> hey, you guys. All right, let's get situated here. All right. Hey, my fellow space enthusiasts. Uh, I'm Rachel Crane. Uh, like the introduction said, I am CNN's space and science correspondent. And I am so glad to join you all today for this very important conversation about revolutionizing science from the ground to orbit. Hopefully everybody will leave here today in complete awe of all of the incredible science being conducted on the ISS, as well as inspired by the new capabilities and possibilities for microgravity research. All right, so just to give you a little breakdown of what the session will entail, I'm going to be in the pilot seat uh, for what is sure to be a riveting conversation with amazing NASA astronaut Kate Rubens. She is going to begin the session by showing you and narrating a short video of her launch and mission overview, after which we will have a dialogue and I'll do my best to control all of the questions that I have for her. Uh, and then we will uh, be joined by two of the principal researchers from the experiments Kate completed on orbit. Uh, so to begin, let me uh, give uh, Kate a, uh, let me do a, a a brief, brief breakdown of who Kate is, as we all know. Uh, Kate Rubens was selected by NASA in 2009 as part of the 20th NASA astronaut class. On Expedition 4849, Rubens completed her first space flight in which she spent 115 days in space, conducted two spacewalks. Oh, and she also became the first person to sequence DNA in space, eventually sequencing over two billion bases of DNA in microgravity and the first person to work with beating heart stem cells in space, but more on all of that later. Uh, Kate's NASA profile is not that of a traditional astronaut. Her background does not include time spent as a military pilot, nor is she an engineer. Instead, Kate is a world-renowned microbiologist. She received her BA in molecular biology from UC San Diego, and then received her PhD in cancer biology from Stanford University. Her work as a microbiologist has fo focused on the most virulent of diseases, like HIV, Ebola, smallpox, and her work with monkeypox even brought her to a remote village in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And also joining us on stage are the principal researchers of some of Ruben's investigations while on station. Uh, we have Arun Sharma uh, and Sarah Wallace. Arun received his PhD from Harvard Medical School and began his investigation of the effects of microgravity on stem cell-derived heart cells as a graduate student project. He's been, uh, he's been recognized in Forbes 30 Under 30 for scientific achievement, and Sarah is a NASA microbiologist at Johnson Space Center, 
who works to uh, reduce the risk of an astronaut getting sick from an infec infectious microorganism and to prevent microbes from messing with the systems of ISS. She is part of the biomolecule sequencer group, and it was her work with Rubens that showed that DNA could, in fact, be sequenced in space. She also loves Elvis, which is awesome, because he's great. And she went to space camp, and she says she went to the cool one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to kick all this off, Kate, why don't you uh, show us your launch and mission overview video? Yeah, absolutely, if we can play the uh, video that we've got. Uh, this is a little bit about uh, Expedition 48 and 49 on board the International Space Station. So we launched um, uh, July 7th, just over a year ago. And this is kind of the culmination of about two and a half years of training. By the time you get to launch morning, which is very, very early, uh, you're in the middle of the desert in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. And uh, we suit up in our Sokol suits. We do a pressure check because this is our, our life-saving equipment in case the capsule depressurizes. And we walk out and actually report to the Russian Commission. And this is where we really get finally certified uh, to get on board the rocket. And, and we're certified for space flight. Um, so we walk up these stairs, we get on top of the rocket, uh, and that's where the training stops and real life actually begins. Uh, so this is nothing like the sim. Uh, when it actually launches, you're very aware that you are leaving the planet. Um, but we had a two-day trip to the International Space Station. And I have to say, opening the hatch to the space station for the first time, we spent a lot of time in the sim. Uh, the, the walls are familiar, the equipment is familiar, but there's nothing like actually seeing the space station for the first time and seeing uh, how big it is, uh, how beautiful it is, and how high fidelity the, the actual flight hardware, everything's very shiny on the outside as you come up to it. Uh, so we came in and we were very excited to see our crewmates, um, uh, Jeff and Alexei and Oleg, who are up there already. Uh, of course, one of the first things that you have to do when you get in is do a news conference. Um, this is after you've been in, spa in the space station for about an hour and nobody's feeling very good, so you have to balance and try to not look queasy on camera. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the very first activities we had actually uh, less than 72 hours after la uh, launch was uh, getting the Dragon SpaceX 9 vehicle. And so we have to actually capture this vehicle working in teams uh, with the robotic arm. This was incredibly exciting to us because uh, the vehicle brought the international docking adapter. And so this is a piece of hardware that's going to allow us to dock commercial crew to the space station. It was also very exciting because uh, we had this, this docking adapter, we needed to install it outside, and that meant uh, that we were definitely going to go do a spacewalk. Um, so very quickly, uh, within the first few weeks of our mission, we actually started prepping the suits. Uh, the actual day of the spacewalk takes, uh, you're about in the suit about 10 or 11 hours. It takes quite a long time to get in the suit, um, to start the pre-breathe process. Uh, you then get kind of shoved in the airlock by your good buddy and uh, cram everybody in there as best as you can, start depressurizing, go to vacuum and, and actually open the hatch. And so this was the first time that I'd ever been outside in space uh, to actually open the hatch. I think my legs were kicking, they said, because I was so excited to actually get outside uh, and to see the planet. Um, spacewalking is an, it's an incredible thing. It's one of the most outrageous things, actually, that we do as human beings. We, we treat it as routine at NASA. Um, but it is really, uh, it's challenging, it's, it's physically hard, and it's incredibly mentally hard because you realize that everything you're working with is somebody's incredibly expensive piece of hardware. This is some piece of hardware that costs more money than you're ever going to make in your lifetime. Uh, and you need to actually install it on the International Space Station. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, really incomparable to have that view of the planet when, when it's just your visor and, and all you can see all around you is a beautiful view of the planet. So we, we successfully accomplished our first spacewalk. We installed the docking adapter and they said, all right, you guys are going to go out at another one and, and actually uh, retract this radiator that we're worried about uh, micrometeoroid debris on this radiator. Um, so we retracted the radiator and installed two high-definition cameras, which actually um, allow us to do photographs of both the Earth and the space station. And this is an example of, of some of the kinds of things that we can actually install on the space station externally. Um, the astronauts don't ever mind if you propose to do a payload that's, in, that's externally installed because we get to go do a, a spacewalk. So I'd encourage you all to, to propose those kinds of things. Uh, some of the things that we actually do inside uh, that I think is, is uh, one of the most incredible opportunities for us uh, and for scientific observation is actually using the facilities on, on board ISS to do astronaut photography and to capture 
uh, images. So we talk a lot about the remote sensing platforms, um, but we can do a lot with uh, photography uh, from the space station, from the cupola. And so we can get things like oblique angles. We can get different times of the day. Um, you can ask the astronaut to focus on a particular area to use different camera lenses. Uh, so the amount of uh, geological features that are available, looking at uh, weather patterns on the Earth, looking at uh, things that are happening in the oceans or on land. It's amazing just flying over the same uh, place and then uh, after a few months flying over again when it's a slightly different season, how different the Earth looks and how much it's constantly changing. And we are able to view that from the space station with the advantage of having a human actually taking those pictures. Um, it was pretty incredible to see the phenomenon, uh, lo things like looking over the horizon, watching a volcano, uh, looking at ice flows in Antarctica or glaciers. Um, it, and it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I think astronauts always look forward to these types of experiments. Uh, it's a challenge to capture this photographically, and we absolutely love doing that. Uh, just the, uh, the opportunity to see these views of our planet is amazing. So some of the other payloads that we worked on inside, um, you can see here working in the microgravity science glove box. This is actually a Rudin's payload. Um, so these cells came up live on SpaceX 9, and we, we pulled them off right away uh, and started doing cell culture. And this was pretty incredible because this was the first time we got a chance to do long duration cell culture on board the ISS. So we actually cultured these cells um, for 30 days and then sent them back down. Um, they landed off the Pacific Ocean, got put in a car, and, and actually got driven back to Stanford to a Rune's lab. So this is an incredibly well-traveled uh, set of cells. DNA sequencing was another huge highlight, actually. Uh, Sarah and I were wanting to get this on the research plan as soon as possible. Um, we'd been working on this for a while, and uh, this was the first time that we'd actually seen a, a, a base go through the sequencer. And so uh, what you don't hear in the background is everybody kind of screaming and cheering and uh, the whole space station crew was gathered around actually watching the very first uh, base pairs to come through. Of course, we did one, and then we wanted to do every other sample that we had, so we actually managed to get quite a lot done on board. Some of the other kinds of work um, that we do is uh, things that don't necessarily resemble your typical lab work. Um, here we've actually uh, got the wet lab experiment, which has 3D printed a rotor in order to spin to centrifuge samples uh, on the, on, uh, like you would in a centrifuge on the ground, and they put it on a drill. Um, so this is a kind of innovative thinking where uh, we don't necessarily need to buy and build a centrifuge and get that flight certified. Uh, 3D printing works great. One of the things that I was interested in, this isn't any particular payload, this was kind of Kate on the Saturday, uh, uh, doing interesting experiments in space with fluids and uh, pipetting. So one of my interests was, can we use things like a 384-well plate or a six-well plate uh, and, and use normal COTS pipetters? And how much can we actually do with just plasticware that we would send up from the ground? So I started with a 384-well plate um, because I figured that would have uh, the smallest uh, volume and we're going to have the most surface tension there. But even things like a 96-well plate, a six-well plate, uh, a 50-mil conical, you can see the 50-mil conical is the source of There. It remains relatively unperturbed, and so uh, as long as you don't fill the wells more than halfway, we actually really can use COTS hardware and the combination of surface tension to keep all of these samples inside their sample containers. And this is, I think, incredibly exciting in terms of reducing the payload cost in the future. Uh, this is one of the payloads that, that Talk was working on here. Um, the ability to put things in an airlock and actually get them outside the station uh, is pretty incredible. So we assembled quite a few things. One of the things was the, uh, uh, the robotic external leak locator, the REL. Um, and we can coordinate with the, uh, with the Japanese arm and the external platform to actually pull these experiments off and put them on the platform. Or we can do things like launch uh, small satellites from the space station. And this is a, a pretty incredible experience to actually watch these satellites fall away from you towards the Earth. It looked like two people skydiving off of the space station. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, combustion. This is the combustion rack on board. Um, and we have a variety of experiments that we can set up in this, in this rack to actually look at um, combustion. And the video observation of this rack is pretty incredible for documenting uh, the various phenomena. 
One of our other experiments is a SPHERES experiment. This has been a long-standing experiment on space station. Um, the one that I particularly like was actually the SPHERES slosh experiment. So we were using the SPHERES satellite uh, with a container, a 20-liter container that had about four liters of liquid in it. And we we're actually trying to simulate uh, various motions, so uh, a launch motion of a rocket or a spinning motion. Um, so we did this experiment for quite a few hours, and then at the very end, they said, this is the part that you're going to really like. You get to uncover uh, the actual tank and then do some manual rotations. And so you can, you can take a look at what's happening with the fluid, and you can actually observe it uh, with all these various rotations. And to me, this is fascinating. I think we have a lot to discover about the properties of fluids in space. Everything from uh, how small 10 microliter droplets behave in a 384 well plate to these four liter tanks of fluid. Um, so we, uh, we actually uh, had a great time welcoming our new crew members on board the space station um, after Jeff and those guys left. And uh, the next thing we got a chance to do was capture uh, a Cygnus vehicle. So this is an orbital ATK. Um, and this was a, a lot bigger than the Dragon. Uh, it's, it's module sized and actually brings us um, a huge amount of cargo. So we were so excited to capture this beautiful module. Uh, and then we open the hatch and we look around and we're like, wow, this is a lot of uh, science and consumables and supplies that we're going to need to unpack now. It's actually uh, pretty magnificent what we've got established as a logistics supply to the space station. So we were there for 115 days, um, and eventually it was time for us to undock. I protested a lot, called the flight director, said I didn't want to leave, um, and they said get in the Soyuz anyway and come home. Uh, so we, we undocked, and uh, you do the, the deorbit burn after a few revs around the planet. So you're just in this tiny Soyuz going around the planet. Um, then you fire the engine to deorbit. And pretty soon thereafter, you start uh, encountering the atmosphere. And it's actually, I think, pretty fantastic to return in a Soyuz. You're, you're returning inside this little bell-shaped capsule. Uh, and you really are in the middle of a, a meteor that's burning up. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't get too, too hot inside the capsule, but there's certainly plasma outside. Um, you see things coming off the vehicle. You actually see the heat shield ablating. Uh, and it, it feels like um, you're going to be pretty excited if you actually survive any of this. So, when the, when the parachutes open, uh, you know, that's a very good feeling. The, everything stops uh, rocking around and, and you have a few minutes. Um, you know what's coming, though, because the Russians always say uh, soft landings with a wink. Um, that's, their, that's their greeting towards you. It's anything but a soft landing. It's really an earth accident rather than a car accident. You, you hit with a fair amount of force. And, uh, after you realize you still have all the teeth in your head and you appear to be in one piece, uh, it's actually a fantastic feeling to open the hatch to see the first uh, non-crew humans that we've actually seen in months, um, to smell the atmosphere, to feel the wind on your face. And uh, our crew really had this feeling of being back at home on our planet again. Uh, we, we knew that we had a good mission. Uh, we really enjoyed all of the science that we did up there. Uh, but we were very re happy to be back on the Earth and uh, reunited with our with our Earth, fellow Earthlings after being in space for, for four months. So, uh, Kate, if I understand your journey to uh, the International Space Station was unique in that you actually spent two days in the Soyuz, what was that experience like and what did it smell like? <laughs> Yeah, so it is a little bit like a, a camping trip in a VW Bug with two of your closest friends. It's not a large vehicle. Um, and it's, a, you know, once you hit Miko, there's, there's just so much of this, okay, we're still alive, you know, the adrenaline rush wears off, and, and you're in space. I mean, you frankly don't care too, too much about how it smells up there. Uh, for me, I was actually uh, pretty excited about the fact that we could orbit the planet for two days in a small capsule. Uh, when, you're, when you're in the space station, you don't feel things, uh, like during a reboost, you can barely tell that you're actually moving. But when you're in the Soyuz, um, you really can feel the engines fire, and you can actually feel uh, every kick of the, of the small thruster, and you can feel the vehicle moving. Um, you, you can tell the, the structural nature of it. It's, it's, uh, to me, it was a, 
a throwback to the early days when we had people orbiting in these really small capsules. So I thought it was a, a unique opportunity, um, and I didn't mind being in that, that small space because it was such a, a one-time experience. So you didn't mind t for doing it for two days, even though most only do it for like a couple hours. No, no, it wasn't bad. So Kate, what motivated you to go into uh, the sciences? Uh, so when I was little, actually, um, I always wanted to be a scientist. That was always in my list. I wanted to be a, a biologist, a geologist, and an astronaut, all three. Um, and uh, I got really interested in uh, recombinant DNA, actually. I went to a conference on recombinant DNA, and I'd participated in some public health programs and started getting in, into HIV, into virology. And I had also gone to, to space camp as well. And so... The cool uh, one? Yeah, the cool one. <laughs> so all three of those things were kind of kicking around. Um, so tell us about the training that you did here uh, on Earth. Uh, the, some of the, you were working on obviously very significant uh, experiments while in space. So how do you train to run those experiments here on, on the ground, uh, you know, preparing to be in space and actually running them? Yeah, so we actually do a lot of skills-based training. Um, it's hard to determine what specific payloads you're gonna have on your increment. And uh, we tried for a long time to train astronauts to do these specific payloads, and we found that you, know, you do this training and then two years later, you don't, you don't remember what's, what happened in your payload training. And so we're now taking astronauts and we're actually putting them through uh, courses, for example, in Sarah's lab, where we teach them how to do cell culture, we teach them how to handle rodents, and so they have the basic skills to actually be able to execute any experiment where you're uh, doing things like pipetting. Uh, we give them the basics on the SIRRAC so that they can handle combustion. Uh, we teach them, uh, you know, what we're looking for when we're analyzing things coming out of the 3D printer. And so we give them this basic set of skills, and then uh, through the procedure and, and often through talking to the PI during the experiment, we can get this experiment executed at a really high level of quality. So beyond the whole microgravity thing, what, uh, what are the major differences between a space-based laboratory and a ground-based laboratory? Yeah, so in, in space, you actually always have to think about what you're holding on to uh, and how you're going to secure it. So if you have a few things in your hand and you let them go, they're gone and, and you're looking for them. So if you ever watch on video uh, of the space station and astronauts doing this, it's because they've, they've just lost something and they can't figure out where it is. <laughs> and it's probably floating behind a rack. I think we found Julie Payette's spoon up there. Um, so it is, uh, it's one of these things that you don't think about too much on the ground because you have the luxury of putting things down on your bench and they generally don't walk away too much. Um, so being able to Velcro things down, being able to fix things, uh, and then also thinking about the fact that the astronaut has to stabilize themselves while they're doing the experiment. So you can stabilize yourself by holding on to a handrail or you can hook your feet in somewhere, but you're working, uh, you're not just sitting in your lab chair or standing at your lab bench, you actually are working very actively to position yourself in six axes while you're doing the payload. And so uh, thinking about how if, if everything is floating and the experimenter is floating, how do we make this easier uh, to, to capture everything and to have it uh, you know, be in one place and to have it stabilized for the astronaut to work on it? What do you see as the greatest opportunity for future payloads? So I think I've got a, a molecular biology bias, of course, um, but I think we're actually just entering an era where we really can do high throughput. So we, um, you know, we started with zero base pair sequence, and, and it was two billion by the end of the increment. Um, and I think we can we can start to do a lot of things where we're actually taking uh, rather than just one sample. Uh, and one gene that we're doing things like uh, what, what Andy was talking about, where we're actually looking at uh, the entire transcriptome of a sample or the entire epigenome. And we're doing this in a really high throughput manner. So I'd like to see things be processed in 96 well plates, um, be multiplexed and, and run on the sequencer so we can actually get um, you know, 10 samples at a time in a single experiment. And I think we also need to think about um, with a certain number of years left of space station, what are the kinds of things that we want to be collecting? What data, uh, what samples do we want to collect right now that we're going to analyze later? Maybe those are human samples, maybe those are cultured cell samples, um, but a little, thinking a little bit prospectively about the, the types of banking and the samples we want to collect so that we have this data in the future. So it's been about a year since you were launched into space. Now having had time to reflect on the experience, what are your biggest takeaways? 
um, that I'm kind of mad that I'm not still in space. <laughs> I really miss it. I, I think about the space station a lot. I loved being up there. Um, the days in space, they're, they're very long, they're very busy, they're grueling, uh, but it's, it's really, a, it's, a, you know, it's such a phenomenal place to be. And I think, you know, I, I thought a little bit before the mission, I thought, well, you know, maybe after a week or two, the excitement will wear off and this will get old. Um, and that's absolutely not the case. I mean, even the day that we undocked, I was still at the window watching us go over continents, you know, taking pictures uh, of, of up the coast of Brazil where we were flying over and uh, finding new phenomenon. That's, I think that's one of the things that every astronaut talks about. They, whether they're a scientist by training or not, they turn into one on board because uh, it seems like the laws of physics have changed. Everything that you assume uh, about fluids or falling or the way things should move has absolutely changed and you, you kind of want to just continuously be investigating that. So um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to stop uh, playing around with the, with the pipettes or the heart cells or the sequencer or anything really. I, I wanted to stay up there and, and uh, continue to learn and to document some of these things. So Arun, why stem cells in space, and what was your research specifically uh, looking to learn? Sure, so we have a general idea of what happens to the different organ systems of the body in, uh, during long-term exposure to microgravity. In particular, uh, the heart and the other muscles of the body tend to atrophy a little bit, so they actually diminish in their mass. So we know these things that happen at the organ level but there are some new advances in stem cell biology that allow us to interrogate organ function at the cellular level as well. And so that's kind of where our particular project came into, uh, you know, came into play. We were using a revolutionary new advance in stem cell biology, the ability to make stem cells from a small sample of a person's own skin or blood, and then transform those cells into beating heart cells cells that you can actually see visually contract under a microscope. And this is a very powerful system because you can utilize these cells to study cardiac phenomenon, cardiac biology on the cellular basis. So what we wanted to do was to examine what's the effect of microgravity, not just at the heart level, at the organ level of the heart, but at the individual cells. So we were trying to examine changes that happened uh, over long-term exposure to microgravity, changes that happened at the genetic level in these cells, changes in their cell shape and size, as well as changes in their ability to contract, to beat. Of course, the, the heart is composed of billions and billions of individual cardiomyocytes, which are the individual beating cells of the heart. And if we can distill down the, the function of the heart down to its cellular components, then we might be able to better understand at the cellular level what happens to microgravity and in, in, to the heart in response to microgravity. And would those insights also give you uh, any uh, information? Were you guys looking to learn anything about these cells here on Earth as well? Was this research just, uh, you know, just looking to see what the impact would be in a microgravity environment? Or are you hoping to gain any insights that might help the rest of us here on Earth? Absolutely. So, you know, I guess uh, we're obviously very interested in seeing what happens to these cells in long-term exposure to microgravity. But in addition, this particular experiment had a lot of benefits for us planet side as well. One thing we actually discovered uh, when we're going through our results kind of as I speak, uh, one thing we actually discovered is the cells change slightly in terms of their way in the way they contract on orbit. But for the most part, those changes in contractility revert back to normal as the cells return to the planet. And that actually tells us a little something about cardiac physiology that tells us that the heart is a pretty robust organ and that it can tolerate these environmental changes, but when it's reverted back to its normal environment, those changes can revert back to normal. So in addition to learning a lot about microgravity and its effect on the heart at the cellular level, we were also learning about just how robust the heart is as an organ. Sir, why sequence DNA in space? Why not? <laughs> um, no, like honestly. <laughs> Um, the way we've been doing spaceflight research um, forever is if we're sending these experiments up and, you know, we can get some data on orbit, um, Arun's getting his visual data, um, but really then 
you know, research either has to be frozen or fixed in some way and brought back. And so the ability to do this kind of analysis on orbit really will give us a better idea of the true state that the cells, organisms are in at that time and what they're experiencing in microgravity. So this would open up huge possibilities for researchers to get true insight into what's happening in the microgravity environment of space without having to alter them in some way to get them back to Earth. For the two of you, what is it like to work for you know years on an experiment and then have it launched into space? You know you're over 200 miles away from it. Walk us through what that experience is like. Um, well, from a personal perspective, I grew up in the Rocket City of Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I never actually had the chance to go down to the Kennedy Space Center to to watch a launch, uh, but to to actually just be in person there for the SpaceX launch and to be a small part of history in that way was just personally very gratifying. From a professional perspective, it's kind of nerve-wracking knowing that something that you worked on for this long, for three and a half years, is leading up to this one moment. And we were very fortunate in that our launch went very well thanks to our implementation partners in BioServe Space Technologies, everyone at CASIS, as well as uh, the team at SpaceX. Um, it, was, it was certainly a nerve-wracking experience, but in the end, everything went very, very well. And after a few days, Kate was able to receive our experiment and immediately get started on our work. Era. Yeah, it was a year ago today that it launched, and so I think that's that's really cool that we're sitting here now talking about something that just launched a year ago. Um, we had, um, JSC had ish, uh, initiated a new process to quickly get science to station, um, and we were kind of one of the, the guinea pigs for that, and so we had only started working on the project in, in February of 2015. So for us, it was actually a really a short period, um, but we worked so hard on it. And so the ability to be there and see it launch um, was just, it was the most exciting thing. And I think it's something I'll never forget. And it was just knowing that, you know, for me, knowing the technology that we were putting up there um, could really change spaceflight research was just definitely the most exciting thing I've ever, ever experienced. So Kate, as uh, an astronaut on the ISS, you are the, the eyes, the hands, the ears of the researchers. So what's running through your head when you're running these experiments? Yeah, I think working with some of the payload developers, you know what goes into these experiments. And so um, the, uh, the rest of the crew would kind of joke when I was getting ready to, to pull out the heart cells or the sequencer, they're like, do not bother Kate. She's taking care of her stuff. She's got like, she's got her babies and she's feeding them. And she's, she's you know, she like, just don't get near her because she's focused on this. But it was really, um, you end up caring a lot about the experiments. It is something that, you know, you absolutely want to make it work. And I think, um, you know, we, we actually uh, have moved towards uh, a set of experiments where it's very predetermined, right? We, we send things up. Uh, we have the astronauts follow the procedure step by step and we get the data back. And I'd like to see us do some of the kinds of things that, that we were actually doing where we were doing some more iterations. So, for example, with the runes experiment, we were actually looking at it and, and looking at the cell culture uh, when we changed the media, looking at the bubbles, looking at different techniques to uh, feed the cells and to change the media without introducing bubbles and actually making those observations and going back and forth over space to ground. Um, and with, with Sarah's experiment, we uh, had initially started, we were going to do three samples. They, they needed to verify it in triplicate. And I remember at a meeting uh, a few years ago, we said, you know, why don't we send, why don't we just triple that? Why don't we just send nine? And in that way, if some of them don't work, we can actually do some troubleshooting. And that ended up being really valuable. We were able to use the rest of those nine samples to do things like test the flow cell age. And so things that weren't necessarily initially in the experimental plan as your primary objective, um, but because we sent just a few more tubes up, we actually were able to work and in real time add to the experiment, change the experiment based on some of our initial observations. Uh, when we have this platform and we've got more crew time up there and we've got these long duration flights, we can actually take some experiments, get some data in real time, uh, and I think do some additional follow-on experiments. I think that's really exciting for researchers. Sarah, as a researcher, what are you excited about? I mean, wh where is this all going? What's next for you? Well, so I am a microbiologist at, at the Johnson Space Center, and so while I'm very excited about the sequencer for everybody's research, um, I'm, I'm really kind of 
biased about using it for, for microbial um, analysis. So what we're doing now is when Kate did it, she had sequenced um, DNA that was from a, a virus, a bacteria, and a mouse, just to show that any DNA can be sequenced by this, this sequencer. Um, so what we're doing now is we have started collaborating with the Genes in Space program um, that has mini PCR that was already on board. So with that, we can amplify DNA. And so what we've been able to do now, it's called Genes in Space 3, and we've been able to um, send up some more DNA, and actually Peggy, who's on board, has been able to um, amplify it and then prepare it for sequencing and actually, actually sequence it. Mm -hmm. And so where that's going is next month we have planned to take one of the microbial samples um, that the astronauts collect and culture on board as part of our medical operations, monitoring the environment, actually take some of those, which normally we don't know what they are until we get that sample back on the ground. But we're gonna take it and put it into our Genes in Space 3 process, where we'll actually identify unknowns for the first time in space. So that's really what I'm most excited about. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and Arun, I know you mentioned that you now are getting back some of the data from the uh, investigation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've learned thus far? Sure, absolutely. So we're still in the process of wrapping up some of the genetic analysis. Hopefully we're going to get things done by the uh, end of the summer. Uh, one thing in particular that was really interesting that Kate was actually able to observe on orbit was that these cells, the, the heart cells, they actually contract beats slightly different on orbit in comparison to their ground side controls. But the cool thing is when these cells actually return back to the planet, they actually reverted back to their normal beating rate. So that actually tells us something about the heart, something about how it's able to adopt uh, adapt back to the normal gravity once the experiment is over, once the astronaut return back, returns back to the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very informative, useful information that we can use to, to better understand cardiac physiology. And what's next for you? The next step, um, I would be really interested to take this 2D cell culture experiment and turn it into a three-dimensional experiment, potentially even incorporate some of the high throughput aspects that Kate was uh, alluding to. What if we could better understand not only how the individual cells of the heart function, but how they function in their native three-dimensional environment? Could we send a sample of a three-dimensional tissue, and perhaps could we send multiple uh, replicates of the three-dimensional tissue? That could be the next step that we could take to study cardiac physiology and microgravity. So, Arun and Sarah, can you sort of walk us through what the process is like preparing your investigation to go to space, um, uh, how much time is required, and was it worth it? Absolutely, 100%, without a doubt worth it. Um, I, my day job is, is a microbiologist, and so um, having this payload was, was kind of on the side for me, but I mean, we were, we were there's a team of, of four of us that were really core in, in getting this up there, and it was, it was a lot of work. You have to go through a lot of processes um, just to make sure that what you're putting up there is safe and is not gonna in any way harm the crew or harm the vehicle. And so things like just the reagents um, that we were flying to do, to do the DNA sequencing, having to make sure toxolo toxicologically that it was safe, um, that was more work than I, I realized that would go into it. Um, and, and just the whole process of making sure we could get everything flight certified. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of work and it was kind of our life for that period in time, and it still is, but I think that we, we know, we see the potential of this. And so we're, we're driven to keep pushing it forward and, and definitely absolutely worth it. Oh, absolutely. It's, <laughs> I think scientifically it's the most rewarding thing I've ever been a part of. Um, yeah, I mean, I would do it again, 100 times out of 100. It sounds like you would definitely do it again, Absolutely. Kate. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, in your dream world, if you were launching to space tomorrow, what types of experiments would you be hoping to work on? Yeah, I think there's a you know there's some huge capabilities that we're building now on board station to actually really be looking at model systems. So uh, being able to look at at cell culture systems. Uh, I think the, the NCATS, the tissue chips experiments are going to be incredibly exciting where we're looking at these three-dimensional models of culture. I'd like to continue uh, looking at cell culture of all different types of, of tissues um, and being able to get real-time readouts of those in board, whether they're, they're microscopy. Um, I think uh, you know, being able to do things like fluorescence microscopy would be incredibly exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm also a, of a microbial bent, and so you know, I want to completely analyze the, the microbiome of the spacecraft and the astronauts. I think there's a huge uh, amount of really interesting work that's out there 
that we have not discovered molecularly. Um, we've taken a few samples from a few time points, but really doing time intensive courses and doing genomic type profiling uh, where you're looking at everything that's present in the sample rather than just what can be cultured out of it. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's probably 200 grant proposals we could write right now uh, just, uh, just uh, between us and, and you guys could too, but I think trying to figure out um, what are the most critical things we need to learn with the space station? How can we use these new capabilities and how can we get the most amount of data uh, in the shortest amount of time and, and really be driving these experiments to an order of magnitude that's 10, 100, or 1,000 times more than what we're currently doing? Great. Well, I want to give you all uh, a chance to ask some questions too because I've been hogging uh, the, the question position. So is there a microphone that's roaming around out there? If not, then maybe just stand. Oh, I see a microphone back there. Um, if any of you all have questions? I think we've got one right up here in the front. Hi. Uh, through your work with stem cells, did you uh, discover any potential applications of um, CRISPR-Cas9 to address these issues in uh, bone loss, muscle loss, et cetera? That's a fantastic question. Um, that's something that this particular experiment <clears throat> didn't examine, but in the future, obviously, CRISPR is an incredibly powerful technology. It's a very easy way to modify DNA of really any organism, um, but that's something that we would definitely be interested in looking into in the future. I think there's another one right there. Um, I was wondering what potential you saw for using microgravity to culture things like organoids, because on Earth, I mean, now that we have the cell culture systems, on Earth they're grown in rotating flasks to imitate the microgravity. So in a system where you have it intrinsically, do you see that as a future route to follow with the cell culture research? Yeah, I think absolutely. The, um, the bioreactor type systems we have on Earth, um, the way they simulate microgravity actually induces a lot of fluid shear, and so it, it hurts these delicate structures. And so if you want to have something that's really relatively unperturbed by outside forces, uh, you realize very quickly when you're in the space station, when you think about it for a little while, you know, the space station is in free fall, you're in free fall, the experiment is in free fall. Uh, and so it's actually, um, I think, a, a you know, really fantastic way uh, if we have the, the vessels that, that we were using with Arun, actually the cells were, were plated on the ground. And so they were, they were adhered to the bottom of the cell culture plate already with then a thin membrane at the top. Um, but we can do things, I think, with larger vessels, uh, with using beads to actually nucleate the cells. I think it'd be really interesting to watch the process of uh, cell interaction in 3D um, to look at the differences between cells seated on the ground and cells seated on orbit. So there's a, there's a huge area to look at three dimensions of tissue culture um, that we just really don't have access to on the ground right now. Uh, in, in looking at the sequence runs that you got from back, bacteria and the mice uh, and looking at the, perhaps a reference sequence, can you make a statement in terms of the fidelity of the sequencing reactions and perhaps DNA polymerase? And then a second question would be on stem cells and looking at the different matrix, uh, extracellular matrix in terms of what, promote, what promotes uh, differentiation and, and growth uh, in space. Um, yeah, so for the sequencing, we, got, we found that the sequencing actually um, was performed a little bit better in space. And what I mean by that is we were able to sequence more DNA in space per run than we did on the ground. And that's hold, held true for every experiment that we've done. And we're still kind of looking into why we think that might be. Um, I'm giving a technical session Thursday afternoon where I'm going to show data of um, how well the, the genomes map to the reference. Um, and I, we have between 98 and 99% match. Um, with all the DNA that was sequenced in space, just in space, we were actually able to create um, just the full genome without a reference. So actually, large that we are able to get really good, good fidelity. So I'll talk more about that Thursday afternoon if you're around. Sure, and in, in regards to the extracellular matrix for growing these particular cells, uh, these cells were actually grown on a pretty standard matrix called Matrigel, 
which is used in a number of different cell culture laboratories around the world. Uh, one thing that would be very interesting is to examine this particular ECM extracellular matrix in comparison to other more chemically defined substrates to see if that would promote uh, better culture of these cells on orbit. And of course, you know, the next step is to do adherence-free cultures to see if, if you grow these cells in a suspension culture, would they uh, mature, would they you know, work even better? So that's one thing that we can investigate in the future. Please have the mic. Hi, just a, just a quick question for Kate. I was really struck in the video how um, the 96 well plate, you just let it rest for a second, you know, um, off, and you quickly grabbed it, and everything was sticking to the plate. And I was just wondering, is there a size range where inertia kind of begins to come into play so that larger volumes, if you were to move it very quickly, it would begin to stretch out? and do what we see with the free-floating bubbles of liquid? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's actually one uh, that we're thinking about asking Peggy to do some additional demo experiments. And so I went all the way up to a 50 mil conical, um, and, uh, you know, with a 50 mil conical, you can actually put a fair amount of force into it uh, before the liquid starts coming out of the container. The, the takeaway for me was that the surface tension is so dominant um, that it actually takes a fair amount of force. And this is something um, that's pr you know, pretty important for us to understand is how much can we use surface tension as containment? What, what kinds of forces can you put into the, uh, into the liquid and have it be impervious to that before it starts flying out of the vehicle and we have to start worrying about containment issues? Um, but with the, when anything is stuck to a container, uh, once the liquid sticks to something, it's gonna move along that surface, whereas the free-floating balls of liquid uh, you know, are going to behave in a much more elastic manner. But once it's on a surface, it, it wants to be in that surface. So it's not like we have um, liquid free floating in the cabin. It, as soon as a droplet gets released, it's going to go adhere to something. I think we had another question right there. I wanted to ask about the cardiomyocytes. Uh, uh, what was the time uh, of return to normal, if we say it normal, after, after the space uh, coming back? You said they adapt in space and then when arrived, they go back to the same bidding. So do you know the time? Right, so we were actually culturing these cells for about one month in addition to, uh, oh, at, at the point where they were returned back to us uh, at our lab in Stanford. Um, we actually saw that within a matter of weeks, they would re revert back to their initial bidding patterns. Uh, so that was, um, uh, we're still in the process of really finalizing this analysis, but really within just a matter of weeks. It was pretty exciting to see. Okay, and if you want me, the second question, did you have controls of the functionality of these cells before going to space and then coming back? Yes, so we actually did some ground side controls pr uh, pre-flight as well. And then when they come back, you also did the, uh, not only functional molecular control or some gene analysis? That's right, right. So when, when they return, uh, actually at different points during and post-flight, right. we're harvesting uh, cells for genetic analysis as well as for contractility analysis as well as uh, structural analysis. Okay, looking forward to the date. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think there's one right behind you. <laughs> no, it's here. <laughs> oh, she has a microphone. She's not asking. Sorry, me again. Um, I was wondering uh, if, so I'm just doing high school biology and there's a lot of fluids involved obviously and then in space fluids get really funky. So I was wondering, um, it, did you notice any significant changes in processes like penocytosis or the more basic ones like diffusion, effective uptake, that kind of thing? Uh, sorry, say again, processes like? Penocytosis, like cell drinking, the, the way cells take in fluids and water, um, osmosis, that kind of thing. Is it significantly different in space? Or yeah, I, I'm not sure how much we've studied that. We've certainly noticed massive physiological changes in terms of, of the fluid shifts in, in humans. Um, but I think there's, there's probably been a fair number of diffusion studies in non-cellular systems. Uh, I think it would probably be pretty interesting to actually look at, uh, on the cell culture level, what's going on uh, with diffusion, what's going on with cell-cell interactions, uh, uh, what's happening with tight junctions, for example, and I don't know that we've uh, really had the microscopy techniques to take a look at that and to take advantage of those. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, maybe you said this, but did you test uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, cells from cardiomyopathy patients as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for these particular stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, you can produce them from individuals who actually have genetic cardiomyopathies or a thickening or weakening of the, the, the heart, the wall of the heart. Uh, for this particular experiment, we were using uh, cardiomyocytes, heart cells from healthy individuals, uh, but definitely to see if uh, in a future experiment we could identify cells from cardiomyopathy individuals and compare those to these healthy controls as well. All right. Well, I think we ended right on time. Imagine that. Oh, even a little bit early, I suppose. Um, all right. Is that, does anyone else have any more questions out there? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. It was so fascinating to learn about your experience and your, uh, your research. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. Talk about putting your heart into your work. That's, uh, that's good stuff. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I'm Jim Way. I'm the incoming executive director for the American Astronautical Society. It's uh, great to have you all here today. Um, we will now take a short break uh, before our lunch with keynote speaker, Senator Gary Peters. Um, to set up for the lunch, we do need everyone to please leave the room. Uh, bring all of your belongings with you, um, and take a few minutes to uh, visit the exhibitors out in the marketplace. Uh, but please do return for the lunch immediately on hearing the chimes. Senator Peters is on something of a tight schedule, uh, and so we'll want to get started right away. So uh, please step out, and we'll see you in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>